All right, thank you everybody. Um, my name is Kirsten Miller Jones. I'm the VP of Small Business for the Central Maryland chapter. Um, thank you all for being here today. Excited to have our January virtual lunch and learn on IRAD for Small Business. Uh, we're gonna have a great panel lined up for, for today. Um, actually, before we, can we jump to the third slide? Just real quick um, to provide instructions for today's event. Um, if you have any questions for the speaker, simply open the Q&A tab on your webinar toolbar um, and type in your question. If you see another question that you'd like to hit up first, just hit the thumbs up button to it'll, it'll move up the queue. Um, and if you have any technical difficulties, just use the chat box on the toolbar to chat with the webinar host and we'll, we'll take care of it. Um, we will be recording this, so if you uh, want to rewatch it, um, share it with a friend. And lastly, we're, we are going to have a little survey at the end. It's going to be real short. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to hand it off to our moderator for today. We have Robert Parlock with us, the VP of Engineering um, at ESI. So Robert, it's all you. Okay. Thank you, Kristen, and welcome everybody to our small business IRAD Lunch and Learn and Best Practices session. We have um, a good set of panelists today. We have, um, I'll give a chance for each of the folks to uh, give a little background on what they do and what the company's about. Um, we have uh, Joe from Intelligence. We have Steve from uh, Innovex. We have Dustin from Clarity Innovations and Wayne from the Aston Group Services. So with that, I think I'll pass it off to Joe first, give a little, little background what Joe's about and his company. All right. Thanks, Bob. Hi, I'm Joe Karolczyk, um, president of Intelligent. So uh, Intelligent's focus is on developing technology that reduces the risk in sharing of information. Uh, much of our government experience is focused in cross-domain solutions development. Um, and we built expertise and thought leadership in this area uh, that has allowed us to explore opportunities across IC, DOD, military, civilian agencies, as well as building commercial relationships. Um, a lot of that's driven by our research and development. So looking forward to the discussion today. Very good. How about Wayne? Give Wayne. You're on your read there. There you go. We, Wayne Johnson with Ashton Group Services. We started Ashton Group back in 2011. We provide back office support for government contractors, um, anywhere from Northern Virginia up to Aberdeen and actually across the US um, with uh, emphasis here in Central Maryland. We provide anything from bookkeeping to CFO financial consulting on the accounting side, um, contracts, ITAR, um, security and HR support services there. Uh, my background is 15 to 20 years in public accounting, which will help support some of the questions and discussions we have here with regard to uh, the tax burdens and costs associated with IRA. Very good. Uh, Dustin. Thanks, Bob. Um, Dustin Zepp from Clarity Innovations. I, I first wanted to thank FCA for the opportunity to be here today, uh, as well as, uh, you know, special thanks to uh, Eric, uh, Devin, Rebecca, Kirsten, Bob, and the fellow panelists. Um, it's a great opportunity. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, so Clarity Innovations, uh, we've been around for about eight years, um, you know, uh, just eclipsed the 100 employee mark. Um, we're a digital services uh, transformation company focused on system software engineering uh, in support of the intelligence community, uh, DOD and uh, commercial. Um, so we have uh, kind of a smattering of service offers, offerings uh, between uh, cybersecurity, computer network operations, uh, advanced analytics, app development, uh, platform um, infrastructure as service, uh, platform as service infrastructure as code, uh, et cetera. Uh, have quite a bit of experience with IRED um, and anxious to, to dig in today's, in, into uh, today's discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Dustin. Last but not least, Stephen. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, so I'm uh, Stephen Common. I'm the Technical Director at Innovex uh, Information Systems. Um, a lot of you may know Innovex from our IC work um, with, with NSA, but um, we do have a group um, that also uh, does a lot of commercial work. So I lead our Innovex Foundry Group, um, which actually came out of our IRAD. Um, so we do a lot of work in the pharma space um, and in the financial services space. Um, and I actually started with Innovex as an intern in our IRAD group. So I'll be able to provide you know, some uh, experience and, and insight on that and some of the R&D contracts we go after. So happy to be here today and uh, excited to be talking about this uh, topic. Okay, thanks, Steve. So, okay, so let's, let's, let's get this party started. So um, first set of 
uh, topics we're going to talk about really revolve around, you know, we as small businesses, like how and when do we determine we're going to invest in IRADs? Um, so, for example, yesterday, I don't know um, how many folks on the, on the call uh, sat through or listened to the uh, contractor outreach session that was uh, our customer put out yesterday, which talked about their top tech challenges and sort of the disruptive technology assessments for 2020. So um, obviously those kind of things I would, I know for us would play into what we would look at in terms of investments and things like that as well. So to kind of get it going and, and for each of the panels to kind of talk a little bit about you know, how do you go about deciding what IRADs to invest in? So to get the conversation going, I, I'll throw it over to Joe, kind of get us going with the discussion. Okay. So, uh, you know, IRAD always has to support the growth of your business, right? Uh, so if the investments that you're making need to be in the concepts that, that, that really fall into your wheelhouse. We're, we're focused on reducing the risk in information sharing we're not going to do an IRAD in game theory, it, you know, because it's so out of place for us that it's going to be hard for us to really sell something concrete. Um, having said that, um, IRAD effort should be tied to a specific outcome, e either a customer goal or a specific technology area where you're trying to grow. So um, let me ask Steven. So Steven, from, from InnoVex perspective, how does what Joe said, does that resonate with you guys? You have a, a same approach or a different slant on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, th I think, you know, looking at technologies in your wheelhouse is extremely important. Um, you definitely want to look at, you know, technology that you're interested in as a company, technology you're familiar with. Um, but you also want to look at technology that, you know, isn't really, you know, deployed or mainstream yet, right? You want to look for something that's innovative. Right. Um, so you want something that's familiar, but you want, you know, an innovative approach on it, even if it's just maybe an innovative way to apply existing technology, or it could be something kind of brand new, but uh, you see, um, you know, customer opportunity there. Um, it, it, it doesn't really, you don't want it to be like off the wall and, and not fitting with your current customers. So that's kind of the key. Uh, it needs to have real business value and, and drive really the objectives and the vision of your company. So this is sort of an open question for all the panelists. Um, how much, for example, you know, we all get the market surveys, the RFIs, we attend, you know, government brown bag, you know, or you know, uh, from our employees or on site, just saying, hey, our customer is probably going to need some sort of solution or, or uh, technology to help in this area. Um, so, I'm, so I'm wondering, and this also kind of ties in a little bit to the um, to the business side of it as well. I mean. I mean, how do you how do you determine how do we determine what the best IRADs are to invest and pursue, you know, as, as small businesses? Somehow, Dustin, you want to give that a crack? Sure. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll kick off. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, I think you know, uh, just return on investment is. Um, you know, having having an understanding of um, you know kind of the mission and your customer set, uh, knowing um, you know where the the gaps and challenges are, um, and then you know obviously having the ability to focus uh, and having that intimacy with the customer to you know drive uh, solutions, whether they be through you know unsolicited white papers or socializing and trying to shape an opportunity. Um, we've been very successful, um, you know, just staying close to the mission, uh, understanding where those gaps are, and then how to drive those opportunities into things like STTRs or SIBRs, um, you know, where it's, you know, minimizing your exposure in terms of out-of-pocket expense because you can, you know, within those constructs, leverage other people's money. And the cool thing about, you know, SIBRs uh, and, and STTRs is you actually get to maintain um, the IP as a small business. Um, so it's low risk, low risk, high reward um, sort of scenarios. And uh, just in the last year, I think we've been successful with at uh, winning five, uh, you know, uh, cyber, well, four, four cyber topics and uh, one STTR. So it's uh, cer certainly been beneficial and doing that close uh, in, in continuing with the customer, I think is uh, a huge benefit. So Joe, I saw you nodding your head a lot. Yeah, I totally agree with what Dustin is saying. Um, I, I think there's a really great way to, to sort of capture the concepts when you're trying to evaluate it. Um, 
So uh, we, we always, uh, we go back to the Heilmeyer questions. We, it, it was a set of questions developed by the director of DARPA back in the 70s to sort of focus in on the, the key drivers behind any kind of uh, research investment. And, and basically, you know, cut, cut to the chase. What are you trying to do? How is it different than what it, the way it's done today? Um, you know, who's going to care about it and what difference does it make? And, you know, what's the, what's the risk in doing it? What's the payoff? And, you know, I, I totally agree playing, playing with other people's money is the way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, so make the smallest investment upfront to convince a customer that uh, this is, this is something worthwhile that they're going to get something out of. That's the way to go. So Stephen, would you agree with that approach? I mean, that's, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I mean, we've done a lot of work with with funded uh, programs, um, whether it's the IMCs or the SBIRs or, or BAAs, um, and that certainly is the best way to go. Um, it's hard to to start that way. Um, you, I, I think, you do need to, you know, put some investment in um, and, and really dedicate, uh, you know, some effort to to exploring what technologies you want to look at. Maybe doing some prototyping, trying to find a market fit for for certain technologies. Um, and you need to do that actually before you do the SBIRs and things like that, because you, to be successful in those, you really need to show that you've done some research ahead of time on that. Um, so they do need commercialization potential um, before you get into those. Um, and if you're not, I think, you know, one of the questions I think we talked about, you know, uh, in preparation for this panel is, you know, when you should invest in IRABs. And I, I don't, I don't know that it's it's when you should do it. it. It's kind of if if you should do it, right? I mean, if you're not, you know, if you don't have that innovative drive, if or someone in your company doesn't have that innovative drive to kind of push that forward, then it, you know, IRADs may not be a good fit for you. Um, but if you really want to explore it and push it forward, and you've got, you know, the environment and the team to do that, then you know, I think you should invest immediately, even if it's a small amount, to kind of do that research. Right. So Wayne, just to bring you in the conversation a bit, I know we're gonna talk about the financials on a separate topic coming up, but um, obviously the financial investment aspect of this has to weigh in, especially on a small business investing in an IRAD. Yeah, absolutely. We, we deal with a lot of small startup companies and they're, you know, they're very eager and hungry to explore and look into new technologies and, and uh, change current technologies, which would all fall under the IRAD requirements. Um, the biggest thing, though, is as you're starting a company is cash flow, right? So cash is king and you have to, you have to pay attention to that significantly. Um, you know, everybody on this call is at a different level in their, in their company's uh, um, growth as well, right? So, you know, when you're starting out and you're one or two people, even though it's, hey, this is a real, this is the, hey, we have a business now, we can deduct these expenses and maybe go after tax credits. Do you actually have the cash flow to start up to, in order to do that? So you really need to look at your foundation of where you're at, plan ahead, plan accordingly. Um, and then as you're going and building the, building the company, you know, look at additional exposures to the, the work that you're doing, the missions that you're working on, and also maybe some historical information that you have or, or technology that you have or you're working on to expose that and, and continue building on those items. Um, but the, 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 the biggest thing is cash flow, right? So, you know, we need to make sure that we're not putting the cart before the horse and we're building that foundation of the company first and, and, and make sure we plan and budget for these types of things. And it may or may not be credited back for tax purposes. So you need to worry about that as well as, you know, what's the payout and what are you willing to invest up front if there is going to be a large payout in, in arrears and you're, you're taking a risk at, at all times in those regards. Right. Oh, very good. So um, just following something that Steven started to talk about, which kind of leads into our next topic for discussion is, you know, we're talking about besides the financial aspect of it is that the, let's just say the culture of a, of a corporation or a group, you know, is it, is it the right fit and, and sort of um, how do you build that kind of culture or get that necessary culture to be able to play and be successful as a small business in, in doing independent research and development. So since uh, Stephen kind of presented that topic, I'll give Stephen the chance to kind of kick us off on that piece. Sure, yeah, I mean, culture is, <laughs> it's a challenge, right? It's, it's hard to build the culture for innovation. Um, you really have to balance, you have to maintain this balance between, you know, exploration and innovation and, and, and trying new things while also, you know, focusing on application and business value. Uh, it's hard to do that. Um, and it's, 
you know, it's not just like, you know, as simple as putting like a kegerator <laughs> in your office and, you know, saying you're innovative and, and cool, right? I mean, you really need to get the right people involved, um, whether it's, you know, interns, which I know we'll talk about later and, and other, you know, bringing in other engineers in your, in your team, but you need to enable them. You need to not only get them the material they need, whether it's compensation, equipment, um, but you, you do need to focus on the mindset and the environment and, you know, kind of the vision for what you're trying to do and make sure they understand that. And that's, that's key to, uh, to building the right culture for, for, you know, innovation in an IRAD. So this is for all you, all the panelists here, but, you know, what are they, when you're looking for employees or what is, is there a, a, a typical, uh, either a skill or personality or, I mean, what, what are the key attributes you look for for employees who who can who you look to work on IRADs, drive IRADs for your companies. So I'll jump in on that one. Um, I, I think someone who likes to talk about their ideas is, is a perfect person to engage, right? They, they, you know who these people are. They they're constantly living for the technology and and you know they they just they love digging in and and really thinking creatively. And then they like to share. They, they want to tell everyone else about it. They, they're a champion or an advocate for the things that they're doing. That's the perfect person to start asking questions, right? How do you, what, what's something that you can do for a customer that will get them to invest either in you, in your program, or in your company, right? And and you, if you have those, the, those advocates, they, they're the ones who are going to be out there working it for you. They're going to drive your your IRAD concepts. Yeah, but that's not good. I was going to say what I would also offer is, um, you know, we do a, a very thorough job at screening candidates, um, you know, coming in and certainly looking for those type A personalities. And we've kind of um, been able to successfully, you know, pipeline and recruit those type of individuals and also looking for folks that are hobbyists. Um, you know, kind of to Joe's point, um, folks that, you know, um, have uh, kind of, you uh, you know, are, are inquisitive, not only about tech, but business, and um, then empowering them to be successful um, by, you know, resourcing them, um, you know, to be successful in, in an IRAD pursuit, or even being able to compensate them, you know, so at Clarity, um, you know, we have kind of an eat what you kill, you know, sort of mindset. So if there's an idea that someone brings to bear, and, you know, it gets briefed to leadership, we feel that there's merit in, in the idea and that we're going to invest some IRAD dollars towards that. If that opportunity hits market, then those employees or that team should benefit from it. Um, so we've had that happen on a handful of occasions um, in taking care of our employees and incentivize them to kind of go above and beyond and empower them um, within that role as well. So there's rewards. Do, you, do companies offer rewards, incentives for employees to come up with ideas or, and again, I don't, I don't know whether, for example, if somebody who's working in a, comes up with an IRAD right idea, whether that's considered part of their job description or whether there's some other, whether it's monetary or some other incentives for um, any of the employees, you guys think are lessons learned or best practices as well? Steve? Yeah, so, I mean, so rewards and incentives, that's also another you know, touchy topic. I mean, I, and I do want to just touch on the last piece we talked about, who are the right types of employees, right? I mean, I think, you know, the, the number one word that comes to mind is fearless, right? You want someone that's not afraid to go out there and try new things, and they have to want to do that. Not all engineers want to do that. I'd say most of them don't, right? They, they like, you know, playing with new technology, but they've got to go out there and, and understand that they're probably going to fail. They're doing things hopefully no one else has done before. Um, and you need that sort of like, you know, that courage as well as the dedication to do that. Uh, and that's, it's hard to find, but that's important. Um, in terms of, you know, rewards and incentives, this is, it's tough because you're, you're trying to do things and save money, but, um, you know, we're also, a lot of us are in an industry where you have, you know, a services company, you, your people are billable and you can pay their salary because they're working paid hours. And, um, you know, pulling them off that to work on R&D projects can, can hurt the bottom line. It can, it can hurt, you know, your, your ability to compensate in, in other ways. Um, and so that's tough, but it's also hard to get people to work their full-time job, build the full hours and work after hours, um, even if you're compensating them. It's, you know, people don't want to work more than eight hours a day and it's hard to do that. And so 
um, you know, we've had success with, with interns um, doing it in a way that's, you know, pretty cost effective, um, but they, they do need experience guidance um, to, to be effective, I think. Um, we've also worked kind of with some of our experienced employees for short, short term uh, prototypes. So we'll incentivize them to work after hours for maybe a couple of months, mm -hmm. develop a new prototype, um, and then we can kind of take it from there. And that's, that's been pretty successful. Okay. Um, let me give Wayne a chance to jump in here too. Is, is in your experience, do you see a certain type of uh, personality or, or, or um, technical background or other attributes that would, you would say, yeah, these generally are the people who are very successful in these kind of, whether it's a startup or it's, you know, taking an idea and, and turn it into a proof of concept or a prototype that could be demonstrated. So uh, free, 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 <laughs> right? So no, um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback on Steven, right? So you, you, it's, again, it's, it's the cash flow where you're at with your business, what you have available and what you're willing to risk. And, and you know, what you're looking at, what you're trying to build. Um, the energetic type in a smaller business is, is who you're looking for. That individual that just can't stop that they'll, they'll work that 40 hours a week and, and, you know, their, their mind is just not stopping and they're, they're, they're continuously like trying to, Hey, listen, I think I can fix this or they enjoy that. It's fun to them. Um, I don't understand it, but you know, that's, that's, that, that, that's for those kinds of individuals. And, you know, they're, they're really driven to try to find something or try to try to fix something, try to develop something new, something along those lines. And then, you know, with regard to the incentive, you know, a lot of times they'll do that for free for you as you're smaller, if they're buying into your company and what you've built and, you know, and, and help you out in that regard up front, you know, like, Hey, listen, if we can do something with this, make that promise, make, you know, and it take care of them along the way as you do grow and, and it will help, it helps you and them along the way and their professional growth, as well as your growth of your company and where you want to go. Thank you. Um, so now's a good time. Let's let's talk a little bit about interns. I know Joe and I were talking a little bit before <laughs> kicked off about um, you know FCA SIPS program, and we were sort of comparing wins and losses a little bit, but just for fun. Um, so um, I'll let Joe kind of kick us off. But you know, uh, interns valuable in an IRAG kind of situation? Yeah, invaluable actually. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'll just point out, Bob, uh, that we still have the sippy cup sitting in our lobby. So, so for what it's worth. <laughs> uh, for anyone who doesn't know, the, there's a summer internship presenta presentation series that uh, FCA sponsors. Uh, and uh, you, you, you can enter your uh, interns to present what, what they've been working on. So, and it's a, it's a really nice way to get some exposure, some networking in the community uh, and, uh, and you give your interns a, a real world uh, presentation experience. So, uh, so we've been doing, inter intelligence been around for 11 years. We've been doing internships for eight years out of the, out of the 11. And uh, most everything that we do focuses on, on research in some area on some program. Uh, a lot of what we've done, we, customers have said, yeah, you know what, I'm interested in that and it's going to be inexpensive. So go ahead and, and you know, we'll pay you for it. Um, so last summer uh, when everyone was remote, uh, we, we had interns working on open source programs uh, and also uh, an intern who was working on fuzzing techniques and, you know, I, just cool concepts, things, things that college students are going to thrive when, when they hear what the concept is that they're working on. And uh, it lets us dig in on, uh, on something specific where uh, we have a, a mentor who is a direct build employee who works with the intern. Uh, it's a small investment to have the mentor working with them and uh, it helps to guide the technology development. Okay, thank you. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that we also have a sippy cup in our lobby. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> but before we before I jump to the next panelist, I, I just want to remind everybody that they can post questions using the Q and A tab at the bottom of the screen. So uh, feel free to jump in, ask your questions. Um, so let me throw it over to Dustin around interns. Yeah, I think uh, Joe hit the nail on the head. I mean, interns are certainly invaluable and. Um, you know, we've been successful in leveraging interns, um, you know, from the Naval Academy through, you know, local uh, academia in support of IRAD, um, you know, and 
and also even some paid internships um, to you know support some surge activities as it relates to IRAD or um, you know some other internal development uh, activities here at the company. And um, you know the cool thing about the IRAD topic um, and and some of the the you know projects that we supported also you know during the COVID pandemic provided a means for. Um, you know, our folks to, to support remote and be working on real world problems uh, and challenges. Um, so we're super blessed to, to have that, those opportunities. And, you know, once again, I know we're going to talk on, on CIBR and SDTR uh, as well. Um, you know, they've been a godsend for us, uh, you know, especially um, as our company has grown over the last several years. So I have uh, much more to add in, in that section. Sure. Steve. Yeah, so internship is very near and dear to my heart as I started as an intern with, with Innovex in our IRAD and, you know, been involved in our in, in, intern program, um, you know, ever since. And so, you know, we, we try to do it every year. It's, it's really is invaluable. Um, it's also, in my opinion, the best way to get, you know, the, the best entry level engineers. I mean, you're able to bring them in for a summer, work with them for three, four months. Um, they, they provide some valuable effort, they learn some things, and you can decide if they're a great fit to bring them in as an entry level engineer. Um, we've done that numerous times, getting people cleared, bringing them on full time, putting them on government contracts after that, or they work in our commercial space and in our foundry. Um, so it's, it's really a great way to get really good engineers uh, and get some work out of them over the summer in a very cost effective way. Very good. G I mean, I mean, um... Bob, if I could add one more thing, uh, just, just as an aside, uh, sure. the, the scholarship recipients uh, from AFSIA are make great intern can candidates. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I give some credit to uh, Jessica Morgan Stern for circulating resumes for uh, potential intern candidates to everyone. Very good. Wayne, you want to add anything to the IRA discussion? With, with regard to the interns, just, you know, make sure you have the proper oversight form as well, you know, make sure they're, you know, you're getting their full potential out of them, you know, they're not spinning their wheels and they have somebody to report to in that regard. Um, and, you know, again, it comes all back into the budget and costs and what you're willing to, to do in that regard, um, what you can help them with and, and, and then and possibly, you know, uh, assisting them in finding a position later on or even with your own company um, as well. So, um, so we had a question um, from one of, the, one of the viewers about, um, we're talking about IRAD investments and things like that. Have, have any of your companies been successful in winning business as a result of an IRAD project? And if you're okay with talking a little bit about it, that would be great. Yeah, so I, I mean, I can start. So, you know, our when I started as an intern, we decided to focus on some novel graph technologies um, as kind of a, a space we really wanted to explore and, and find a good, you know, um, set of technologies we can deploy for, for the government, but, you know, that, that sort of grew into all of the commercial work that we're doing now. So, you know, we've got, you know, multi-million dollar a year business line uh, in our foundry space working in pharmaceutical companies, for example, that only started because of the uh, IRAD program um, and the, the technologies we explored there. Uh, it took several years to get there, but that's you know how we built up all the networking and, and found the customers and the technology expertise. We're able to bring in new interns and new um, employees. So really our, our whole commercial part of our business started because of our IRAD. Good. Anybody else have an example or? Yeah, we have a, a good story I can, I can share. Um, so uh, back in the 2017 timeframe, NSA 21 hit. Uh, at that time, our company was uh, much smaller than what we are today, and um, we had uh, work that was getting teed up for to be our first prime out of uh, MPO. Um, we were working with the with the Air Force, um, and uh, instead of getting a prime contract, we ended up getting a stop work um, due to uh, acquisitions and not being able to uh, uh, execute you know the certain type of work that we were doing uh, in support of MPO. Um, so that put about a third of our company on overhead uh, for about six weeks until we could maneuver out of that. And during those six weeks, you know, we you know, thought, well, uh, we could either you know, sit around and feel sorry for ourselves or we can double down. And that's what we did. We doubled down and 
um, developed uh, two prototypes, uh, one of which now is uh, our commercial cybersecurity company. Um, and, you know, that's led to um, multi, multi-million dollar business uh, outside of, you know, traditional GovCon. Um, so uh, definitely a good story. Um, it was pucker factor when it happened, but, um, you know, we came out uh, on, 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 you know, the upper end and, and really that was driven by uh, having an understanding of uh, critical mission gaps and, and understanding kind of the cybersecurity domain and uh, building capabilities uh, to fill said gaps. Joe. So I was just going to say um, but a little bit different. Uh, one of the projects that we were working on, uh, we, we focused in on a specific performance bottleneck that, uh, that we were experiencing that, that the customer didn't have time or money to really invest in, in trying to figure it out. Um, we, we identified what it was and had uh, had two summer interns work on the majority of the development and uh, ended up selling it back to the customer uh, for a, a decent amount of money. Um, in terms of um, IRAD team sizes, is, do you guys kind of have a feel for, you know, and this may go back to the, you know, uh, large business versus small business um, do you do you sort of have a or think about an optimal size you know given you have to weigh the fact that you know I think Joe you started talking about too is you know that you, ju you just don't want to hire an IRAD or sorry an intern and have them sit in the corner all summer and kind of twiddle their thumbs so you got to invest in some amount of mentoring and oversight um, but in general it's sort of a is there an optimal size you guys like to work with for interns and IRADs in general. Yeah, so I mean, for our for our group, we started with two interns, and then we had an engineer that was um, kind of in between contracts, mentoring for the summer. Um, and we we kind of stayed at that level. Um, we started to get some funding from some like short term prototype uh, places, um, most notably the IMC program through through NSA. So we were able to grow to about three or four full-time engineers, uh, mostly funded uh, through that effort. Um, but when we got into the SBIR program uh, and got some phase two work, that's when we were able to really get a dedicated team. So we've got about five engineers now that are fully dedicated and they support uh, about a 20 person uh, commercial group. That's just our experience. Mm -hmm. Is there, is there a do you think there's a uh, a time or duration that's good for an IRAD? In other words, you know, sometimes we hear, oh, this thing goes on forever and nothing ever comes of it. Or, you know, do you guys kind of think about that? Does that enter into your planning for your IRADs and even perhaps your intern programs as well? Yeah, typically the rule that we followed for IRADs, uh, depending on the level of effort, is a three to five person effort uh, capped at 90 days. Uh, mm -hmm. to get a prototype out the door. And generally that tends to be uh, mature enough uh, to, um, you know, certainly get into a, you know, direct to phase two cyber award um, or other, otherwise you have enough tech uh, and experience uh, doing the, the prototyping for a STTR, you know, kind of phase one um, feasibility study um, that could lead into phase two, phase three uh, cyber awards uh, down the line. So. Yep. Very good. So in terms of, you know, how do we get all this great stuff? And again, thinking about lessons learned or best practices in terms of getting this in front of our customers, I'd like to give each of you guys a chance to kind of talk about, you know, what your lessons learned or best practices on the best way to go around doing that. So maybe Joe, you want to kick it off there? Sure. So, um, so, you know, I, the, the projects that, that we work on are, are pretty pretty agile uh, and it, it as a part of your agile life cycle your customer is is regularly involved in what's going on so you have an opportunity to talk to the customer continuously and I would say uh, on average we talk to each customer at least once a week if not more mm -hmm. and that what that does uh, it it establishes the customer in sort of a, a comfortable conversation with, with you and your project team. Uh, and it 
it opens you up to having other sidebars and things. Uh, and it just, it sort of makes it so that, you know, when, when the opportunity is there to suggest to a customer doing something different or like a new idea, it, it, you're not going out of your way to have a meeting with them. They, they just naturally want to talk to you. So you found that their the customer is um, pretty, not just pretty open, but is very interested and does engage in these weekly sure. connections and. Uh, they're paying for the program. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they, so they want to know what you're doing and mm -hmm. uh, giving them some insight is, is always great. Okay. Um, Wayne, is there anything from your perspective you kind of think about what you've maybe seen or think about the best way to kind of expose these things? It, it, I'm going to follow up with Joe in that regard. What, I, what I've seen from our, our clients and from others out there are, you know, continued um, communication with your customer, what their needs are, what they're looking for. Um, and then, you know, planning, planning out, you know, the ability to, to research and, and, and do that work for them and create those white papers and, and, ex, and expose them to different things out there that you may have been uh, working with or, or something that, that you, you can actually actually touch on or achieve for them. Um, and it, and it, it doesn't have to be totally new. It can just be a revamped project or a, a better process within that project, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, sure. But from your perspective, Dustin. Yeah, I think the key is, uh, you know, going back to, you know, having small mission focused teams and having close and continuing interaction with the customer. Um, that's the best way to expose them to not only the capabilities that, you know, you're developing today, but an opportunity space for what you could be developing for them tomorrow. And then if you can couple that to, you know, kind of that cyber process, um, then you're, you're playing with house money, you know, so it's a win-win for everybody involved. And, um, you know, we've been really, really successful, um, you know, down, uh, achieving that um, over the last several years. So highly recommended. That's the best way to do it. Uh, or, you know, you have the forcing function of a stop work and you just double down and, and have some grit and determination to get after it. Mm -hmm. Those are really the two ways that I see, you know, uh, for, for things being successful. So Stephen, in, in your experience, I mean, besides what we've just been talking about, and anybody else can jump in as well is, you know, as you're interacting with the customer and you're, you know, because Joe mentioned being agile as an agile approach, I'm just interested in wondering if there, you, you come across occasions and maybe what your best practices or lessons learned if all of a sudden you're going down a certain path and this never happens, right? And all of a sudden the customer come back and say, well, you know, after looking at what you've done and thinking about it, I would actually like to go over here. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm interested in kind of like how you guys, you know, how you deal with that, maybe any kind of lessons learned or best practices you might be able to share with us. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, when you're doing IRAD work um, and you're looking at these different innovations, I mean, some of them are going to fail, right? Some of them are not going to lead to, to new business, maybe most of them. Um, mm -hmm. And so it is important not to put all your eggs in one basket, right? I mean, you're, we, when, you know, we're, we're pretty focused on a specific set of technologies today because they've, they've been successful, we've grown them. And so we've got a, a pretty good, you know, momentum behind them. Um, but, you know, a few years ago when we were really just kind of working with a bunch of short-term prototypes and like three month funding here, three month funding there, um, we were working on several projects at once. Um, part of it was a couple of dedicated resources we had. Part of it was bringing people in part-time to, to just do some quick prototypes. And I think that's really important to be exploring a, a number of different paths um, because, you know, if you have this great idea, you know, you're, you're probably wrong about how, how, how successful it's going to be, but it may turn into something else that's successful you didn't, you, you know, see ahead of time. Um, so you got to adjust to that, you know, as you're pitching it to customers, as you're putting out white papers, um, as you're responding to um, solicitations, whether they're RFIs or, or SBIR phase ones or, or things like that. Um, and you start to develop a lot of material, white papers that have been successful. You start to win phase ones. You start to be able to write much, much more complex proposals for uh, phase two SB, SBIRs. Um, and so, you know, those, that's, I guess, a little bit of our experience. Uh, but eventually you find some set of technologies that, that latches on, and then you just put a lot of money into that, um, uh, hopefully government research money um, to, uh, 
to, to mature that uh, to where you can actually you know, create something you can sell or, or an expertise that you can market. Okay. Wayne, Dustin, Joe, anything to add on top of that or? No, okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, because we've, we've mentioned sippers and other, other terms, but probably now's a good time to kind of get into that. Um, talk a little bit about what programs exist that you know, can enable small businesses like ours to collaborate with the government and get their irate efforts recognized uh, perhaps more quickly. And we've talked about what we introduced the uh, SIBRs and the other courses, the NSA's broad agency announcements. So uh, I guess I like to do is give Stephen a chance, kind of bring us who maybe aren't that familiar with SBAs and the, those kind of uh, efforts and kind of lessons learned, best practices and things like that. Sure. So most of our work and funding has really been through two, two programs. One is the Small Business Innovations Research, that's SBIR. Uh, we've been talking about it for most of this uh, call. So uh, go into that a little bit. Um, but also uh, there was a program through NSA called IMCs, which was Innovative Mission Capabilities. As far as, as, far as I'm aware, that program no longer exists. And I don't know if that funding exists somewhere else. I'd love to hear if somebody else has insight into that. But most of our work has been recently in the SBIRs. Um, it, the, the funding comes through OSD, but all the government agencies are able to put out topics. And they come out three or four, maybe three times a year. Um, and typically, you apply for a phase one, which is a six-month project, um, usually a six-month project, about $150,000, um, where you can build a prototype. Um, and then there's a down select, uh, if there's funding, uh, to a phase two. Um, and that's, that's where you really can mature your research. So that's usually a two-year effort, usually about a million dollars uh, in funding. Um, and that's where we've had success. That's where we've developed our um, open source Mobi platform uh, with the Air Force um, that we now sell commercially. Um, and so SBIR is, is a great way to do it, but it, it, it does take effort. and, and <laughs> you will lose some proposals. Um, there's, it's, a, it's a pretty competitive uh, program, um, but if you can get to the phase two level, you're doing really well. Um, and it gives you the ability to do um, a third phase, a phase three, which essentially gives you a sole source contract vehicle um, for other government funding you may have. Um, the, the IMC program on the other hand um, was three month prototypes. So I think it was like 50K for three months uh, to develop a, a prototype and pitch that. We did several of those, which really helped us kind of develop the, the, the foundations for what we eventually transitioned to the SBIRs, uh, which was great. And I know Dustin's done a lot of work, it sounds like, with SBIRs, so maybe he can expand on anything I missed there. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, two, two additional key factors of CIPR, um, and Stephen, you did a great job at kind of outlining, you know, phase one through phase three. Um, another key aspect that I mentioned earlier is that uh, the small business gets to maintain the IP, uh, which is a really big. Um, and the other thing, um, you know, within you know, kind of the phase two and phase three uh, constructs is um, at least the Air Force and maybe some of the other service elements are starting to uh, introduce strategic financing, which you can also, um, you know, solicit other government customers and, uh, you know, in our example, we've had um, several customers seed um, a, a cyber topic, uh, direct to phase two, um, and then uh, AFWorks will match that uh, to some extent. And then if you have additional funds that can be applied um, that are strategic in nature to kind of mature the technology, if there's a commercialization track um, that folks feel that can be realized, um, then you can, you know, uh, I think the strategic financing cap is at like $15 million. So you can really get you know, a huge bang for the buck. And once again, it's, you know, leveraging other people's money. Um, so we learned that uh, early on uh, when we were supporting, you know, then Colonel Nakasone down in the Meat Operations Center, you mm -hmm. know, he had uh, like a $1.7 million budget and executed $32 million, you know, so... Um, you know, that's, that's worked out, you know, well, and uh, I think, um, you know, kind of the transitions and, and as Steven said, it's, it's a lot of work. Um, a lot of the topics that are posted, at least the open topics, um, tend to be um, 
wired. Uh, so you've definitely got to be in and shaping opportunities uh, if you want, you know, to up your, your P-Win uh, as it relates to STTR, cyber topics, et cetera. Very good, very interesting. Uh, Joe? Yeah. So we've taken a different approach, uh, which is to submit white papers against broad agency announcements. Mm -hmm. uh, so not, not just with MPO, but um, I mean, virtually every, every government organization has some sort of BAA that they've posted. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's, a, it's a list of areas of interest for, for research topics, um, usually, Follows a, like a one-year uh, one-year one phase, but every BAA is is a multi-year award thing, uh, and so we we've done sort of limited scope things, and we've also done very broad things for for customers under BAA contract. Um, it, but you know, to to Dustin's point, um, a lot of what's out there that a customer has something that they're specifically thinking about. And you, you need to be engaged with them and, uh, and, and advocating for the things that you're going to submit. In, in a lot of cases where you have some insight with a customer, we'll float an idea past them first before we put the effort into a white paper. Uh, but the, the, the process is pretty straightforward. Uh, most, of, most of the submissions are limited to five pages. So uh, it's a small investment to get it, to see if a customer is interested in what you are proposing. Mm -hmm. And you've had success with that? With oh, yeah. yeah. So uh, the, we've been working under uh, BAA contracts for about five years. Yeah. So Wayne, you want to weigh in on any of this discussion so far? You know, there's there's several things I do want to weigh in on. It, it's kind of with regard to the tax credits and and how they apply to to um, to what we're, our discussion has been thus far, and also what's available out there. Um, so a lot of what we talked about th thus far are actually projects that are have been funded or we're going after funded projects. But there's also many things that that we do on a daily basis that may qualify for. Um, tax credits out there through the federal government, also, also the, through the state, that you do on a daily basis, either through some of your contracts that are eligible and just other things that you're uh, kind of producing or working on in the background. So, you know, I can get into that at, at some point later on um, if you want to, but um, other than that, not really anything else additional um, with, with regard to these specific funded projects. Um, let's see, Dustin, Steve, do you want to add anything before? We move over to, to really getting into what Wayne's talking about in terms of you know funding sources and other perhaps financial or tax breaks that are maybe people aren't aware of because uh, we've been you know we've said a few times during the last 15 minutes or so you know free money and things like that and people might be saying what are they talking about right so yeah nothing okay. nothing to add I, th I think you know I we don't have much on the tax credits although I know we have them but I'll let Wayne weigh in on that. Okay. So, so uh, you know, the, the uh, all, all the tax items had started back in 1980-81. It was very limited to who was actually able to apply. That has been revamped in 03 and in 2015, most recently. Um, and right now, it, it, qualified businesses are anywhere from startups all the way up through large businesses. And it's probably one of the most valuable tax incentives available to businesses out there right now. Um, the research that you do it cannot be funded for the for the tax incentives. The tax incentives are actual credits against your um, against your taxable income to the company, and they usually range somewhere between five and ten percent of your total cost. Um, and this is, stays on the federal side mainly. With startups, uh, if, as a startup in the first five years of your startup of your company, um, they actually can qualify up to $250,000 a year for federal tax credits to offset your FICA uh, cost. Um, companies must be under $5 million in revenue on each one of those years. Um, and, uh, and then there's other there's other credits out there available to uh, small businesses um, up to $5 million as well that aren't necessarily startups and not necessarily offset against FICA cost. And then of course the large business side of things. Um, there are also 
state funding credits in the state of Maryland and Virginia that you can look at. So the biggest problem with all these are they, they can be very complex. So if you're using your mom or pop um, a tax accounting firm, they probably aren't aware of these or are scared to even touch them because they're so complex with regard to what qualifies, what does not, and what you can ask for uh, a credit for or against. And um, the purpose of all this is you need to really document. You need to probably look at a little bit larger tax accounting firm to be able to support you that understands these. And they, in most cases, will still probably need to go out to a consultant to a look and do expiration into what your expenses have been for the year and what does and does not qualify. Uh, most of the time, most businesses on this call probably qualify in one way or another for some credit to this extent. It's whether if the juice is worth a squeeze to run that analysis and to, to receive that credit. So, you know, there, there's several different um, avenues there. Uh, there's actually firms out there that that's all they do that are nationwide and, and they actually explore the opportunities for the credits and explore what type of contracts you have um, and what other items you're working on in the background. So they're actually, if you have uh, some fixed price contracts, there's actually some a possibility for uh, some tax credits there under IRAD um, for some direct labor costs. Um, which even though, you know, some of the rules say that the research cannot be funded, you know, it's even, those are funded dollars in some cases. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's very wide open. There's a very large uh, gray area, you know, just the three main bullet points that you, to qualify to look at is you have to develop or design new products or processes. You have to enhance, develop, or design of existing products or processes or develop or improve upon existing prototypes or software. So that's very broad for many individuals on this call. So, you know, we, if you have any questions with regard to that, I'm more than happy to jump into a little bit more detail, but, you know, just as a very high level, um, you know, I would highly recommend that you explore with your tax accountant, those credits, as well as a couple of others with regard to the business we're in, which include cybersecurity and also security tax credits for the costs you incur to keep a facility clearance uh, and things along those lines. But with regard to IRAD, it's probably one of the most underused and one of the most valuable tax credits out there that, that are available to small, mid and large businesses in this industry. So uh, Dustin or Steve or Joe, when you think about what Wayne's saying is that you guys are saying, yeah, we know that, that's what we do or. Yeah, I mean, it, I guess it, it, get an idea too of like, um, how hard was it to kind of get that going? You know, like uh, Wayne was saying, you know, it may not be f for the faint of heart, but, you know, there are resources out there and, and I, just kind of what your experience has been, you know, if you, if you, you know, I know sometimes might be working on the technical side, not so much on the financial side, but if, if you do have some insights or thoughts on that, I think it'd be great to share it with the group here. Yeah, I know um, a few years ago, we started um, tracking that and doing R&D tax credits. We didn't do it before then, so we probably uh, you know, missed out on some, some credits there. But um, we hired a consultant to do it, and I, I don't have the details. Uh, our accounting team runs it, but they do, we do have to track everything very closely. And, and you know, I agree with, with Wayne, it, it has to be things that are unfunded, and they have some very specific requirements. So every year we bring them in, they talk to our team, to me and, and other leads on my team to, to ask about what projects we're doing, what things we're doing on that project, you know, when they happened, what was funded, what wasn't, they collect all the information and, and they you know, kind of do whatever they need to do to get the credits. But um, yeah, I would, I, we, we have a, a, a pretty good accounting team, but they definitely hired a consultant to come in and do it. Yeah, what I would add as well is that, um, you know, we had, I guess, started in earnest with regard to, you know, capitalizing on the R&D tax credits uh, for the last two years, but our initial year will also provide a three-year look back. So we were able to get, you know, 16, 17, and 18 covered. Um, very, very lucrative program, certainly not well known, very nuanced, highly recommend a consultant and a reputable accounting firm um, to make sure you don't get yourself in hot water. Um, mm -hmm. And even um, some of the contract language 
can be nuanced and there are things, especially if uh, you have prime contracts or even in the subcontracts that you can negotiate um, to get included that may actually uh, qualify for R&D tax credits as well. Um, so you gotta be definitely aware of, of the nuance and uh, once again, you know, highly recommend consultants and happy to talk to anybody that has questions on that. And Wayne is probably the best first guy to, to speak to uh, on the call about, with, with regard to this. Good. So I, I would just agree with what the others have said. Um, this, ha this hasn't been a primary driver for us, but we definitely take advantage of it every year. So, and, uh, and so we, we do what our accounting firm says. So, <laughs> so <laughs> that's it. It's in, in someone else's hands to really work it out and tell us what the real tax credit is. I want to what I wanted to add as well. A lot of these consultants also have a team of um, you know, uh, tax attorneys. Um, so in the event that you get audited, um, that money spent is well worth it. So I would highly recommend you know, the consultant and they know the tax law better than, than anyone. So we had a question about any tax or CPA firms you'd recommend. I, I guess I would rather not in this forum kind of you know, throw out some names, but I assume that you guys would be weighing and anybody would be more than happy if somebody said, hey, you know, can you throw me a couple of, you know, good places to go? Be one of the happy to provide a list of trusted professionals that support individuals in this industry, understand GovCon, as well as these type of tax credits. And, you know, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to do that. Um, just to double double up on what Dustin said, there is that look back period, especially um, you can for your initial uh, uh, for your initial search and, and look through your books of what does and does not qualify. You can look back several years, uh, multiple years, and actually in, um, work with those tax credits in the current year against your current taxable income. So, you know, coming into 2021, which could be a very um, which could change our tax brackets and tax rules and regs this year um, without getting any politics. It's, uh, it, it, it's, it's highly feasible that this year will be a little bit more higher tax burden liability wise against individuals if your income stays the same. So be, be prepared for that. So it might not be a bad year to, to explore that option. Very good. So um, we're just about running out of time. So I guess we started this conversation with, you know, talking about, you know, small businesses and, you know, the challenges perhaps and compared to large businesses. So um, just quickly, um, kind of any last minute, every take 10, 20 seconds each and kind of talk about if you were, you know, any advice or anything you want to give out to the audience in terms of folks who are looking maybe to get into this. we will start with Joe. Uh, I, I would just say it, it, it needs to be intentional. Mm -hmm. um, it, it can't just be haphazard, uh, needs to fit your growth plans and uh, needs to be really focused. Okay, uh, Dustin. Yep, same thing. I mean, definitely focused. Um, you know, shaping is everything, leveraging other people's money uh, is paramount. Um, and sometimes you, you know, it's okay to invest your own money, especially for tax purposes as well. Uh, if you feel that there's merit in an idea, you know, go for it. Swing, swing for the fences every now and again. Uh, Steve. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 great to do if you're focused on that and, and you're dedicated to it. Great way to get new people, interns, try new technologies, and and start up new areas of business that maybe you didn't know you could do before. Um, so, highly recommend it. Okay. Final word goes to Wayne. Uh, just you know, budget be intentional don't don't get outside of your lane and and it can it can become very burdensome financially if you start taking on too much um at different life cycles of your business so just be very careful with that and and plan ahead right so it kind of follows up with every, what everybody said here you know plan ahead be intentional um you know be you know i'm very conservative in some instances a little too much in in some so make sure it's something that supports the growth of your staff you and your business as you go and, and the mission that you're working on all right so um Kristen, I'm, I'm just about ready to flip it back to you. I just want to thank all the panelists. I think this was a great discussion. I, I know I learned a lot. I've been doing this for a while. So I appreciate everybody's attendance. And hopefully uh, everybody who is listening got something out of the discussion as well.
Yep. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. This was fantastic. Um, this is a reminder um, to the group. It, it, we did record this, so if you would like to rewatch it or share it with anybody, we'll have that available soon. Um, we will have a short little survey after this. We would appreciate any feedback. I thought this was fantastic, though. Again, thank you to everybody, um, especially to Eric DeVito, who was a big help on putting this together. Um, lastly, as always, I, I think we're going to try and do uh, some sort of lunch and learn in mid to late March. So if anyone has ideas or topics, by all means, let the Small Business Committee know. So thank you, everybody, and have a great weekend.